Welcome back, everyone. As a reminder, or for those of you just joining us, please keep your mask on unless you are actively eating or drinking. Please silence your phones if you have not already. And please note that there will be Q&A after the panel. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. A staff member will come to you so that you can have your question be heard. If you are joining us virtually via Facebook or YouTube, please drop your questions in the question in the comment section. We will have someone uh, watching those as well. We are honored to have with us today three alumni from the 70s, as well as two current students, to discuss the differences in life at Rutgers back then and now. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this pan panel, Erica Gorder. Erica is the interim university archivist and was previously associate university archivist. She earned her master's degree in history and archival studies at NYU, her MLIS degree from Rutgers University, and a BA from Rutgers College. Ms. Gorder is responsible for all operations of the university archives from appraisal and description to research services and exhibition curation. It is my honor to turn it over to Erica, who will facilitate the introduction of our panelists. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Hillary. Can everybody hear me? Um, I'm really happy to be here and really looking forward to, to listening to our panelists. But I'd like to take an opportunity to give you a brief overview of what Rutgers was like uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. A few statistics, I won't bore you with too many, uh, but uh, the incoming class of 1971, uh, which is the fall of 1967, totaled 1,787 freshmen uh, out of a total of 6,445 Rutgers College students. Now, of course, we had Douglas College as well as University College at that time. Overall, at Rutgers, there were 27,215 undergraduates or students enrolled at Rutgers. The incoming class of 1976, which one of our panelists is from, uh, they started in 1972. And that incoming class was of around 2,000 uh, students, 587 of which were women, because 1972 was the first year that women came to Rutgers College. Uh, and uh, I will note that uh, by one year, uh, the number of women at Rutgers College tripled almost to 1,300 in any year's time. Uh, the total enrollment uh, for Rutgers College was uh, 7,300 approximately. And in 1972, all of Rutgers enrollment was 41,000. So that's a huge, huge increase in just a few years. Today, to give you context, the School of Arts and Sciences, which is mostly the undergraduate college for New Brunswick, and equivalent to Rutgers College, Douglas College, Livingston, and University College, was approximately 20,000 undergraduates just here at SAS New Brunswick. And at Rutgers today, well, actually in 2020, uh, almost 71,000 students. So there's a bit of perspective for you there. Um, to start off, Mason Gross was the president of Rutgers in the late 60s. He started in 1959, and he really presided over, in some ways, sort of the golden years uh, of Rutgers University and higher education in general across the nation. Um, there were several bond issues that infused a great deal of money into Rutgers during that time period, and so there was a lot of construction on campus, uh, New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden. Uh, and there was more of a commitment to educating more students at that time. Um, much of our college experience revolves around academics and social life, uh, but also involvement in the pressing issues of the day. So I wanted to give you a little bit of overview of all the amazing, interesting things that were going on on campus during this time period. Uh, earlier in the 60s, there was a, a beginning of an awareness of the civil rights movement on campus. There were also um, teach-ins, the first, some of the first teach-ins in the Vietnam War in 1965. But things really started to ramp up um, in the late 60s. Of course, the Vietnam War was ever-present um, on campus and protests against it and also in support of it. Uh, also, also, the black student protest movement was a major activist movement at Rutgers and Camden, Newark, and New Brunswick. Uh, the Student Afro-American Society in New Brunswick, as well as the Black Organization of Students in Newark, uh, were very active and also in 1968 presented demands to the university, uh, to, for the university to acknowledge and recognize the institutional racism, as well as encouraging 
many other reforms that really needed to happen in regards to diversity uh, and black and minority students at Rutgers. Uh, Livingston College was founded in 1969. Again, sort of, it was co-ed, championing the idea of diversity, and their motto was strength through diversity. Uh, the Student Homophile League was founded in 1969, the second uh, student organization devoted to, to LBGTQ issues. I was here at Rutgers. The environmental movement was happening. Uh, of course, um, again, uh, Vietnam was ever present. In May 1970, students took over Old Queens Building and the president's office, and this was in response to uh, the extension of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. And of course, the women's movement. Uh, at the time, much of it was at Livingston and Douglas, but when we have uh, women admitted to Rutgers College in 1978, that was a movement that brought Rutgers forward. Uh, and that was in 1972, as I mentioned before. And in 1971, Ed Blaustein became the president of the university. And so that's a very general overview. Uh, and I really want to uh, take time to uh, talk with our panelists now. And what we're gonna do is we're going to have them talk a little bit about themselves. And the first question is, why did they choose Rutgers College or Rutgers University? So we'll start with Dr. Leon Green. Doctor. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, I can let you know uh, from the beginning is that I was an assistant professor here at uh, Rutgers University at the graduate uh, school uh, for psychology in the chemical psychology area. Also, I was on the graduate faculty uh, for the graduate school of applied professional psychology. I spent seven years there. I did another 31 years at the, the VA, Veterans Administration. Uh, a large part of that was being the Associate Chief for Mental Health and Behavioral Sciences uh, for psychologists. Also, prior to that, I did uh, part of a time term as uh, Assistant Chief and well as Acting Chief of Psychology. I started quite a number of programs there. Primarily in the area of obesity, stress management, sexual dysfunction, uh, as, it, as well as working in the, um, the drug dependency program. During this time, I have also maintained a private practice. Uh, maintained that private practice, that part time practice, up until a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's a brief history of who I am in terms of some of the things I've done, but not in terms of identification. A lot of that occurred much earlier in my life uh, in terms of looking at it in terms of the injustices that was being done to black folk. I'm a child of the South. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. I was there when they had to sit down in terms of the bus uh, to sit. At that point, uh, we were not allowed to sit in the front of the bus. I uh, was with my mother when we had to get up and actually move to the back of the bus so someone white could sit there, even though at that point uh, we had been sitting there for a while. Often during that time, we would go to different places to actually be able to use the bathroom. The bathroom was in the back of the restaurant, if it was there at all, or many times it just said, niggers not allowed. This is my early history. So uh, if at times I felt that anger about slight things that happened racially, it started there. Um, and that, that occurred throughout the South that we lived in. Uh, many times there were lynchings, many times there were shootings. Uh, many, finally, we had to leave uh, Alabama as well as Georgia and come north. I expected much different here. Uh, but I only found out that here, racism was much more subtle, but at times it could be quite blatant. I spent time finally at Westside High School. It started off being much more 50-50 black, but towards the end of it, it was uh, much more about at least 80% black. Uh, this was a different environment. Uh, it's in Newark itself, I was hoping that that would be better because uh, I was hoping for a much better education. 
we were in the honors classes. So obviously I thought I was being well prepared to go on to uh, a rigorous academic career uh, at Rutgers. It, it, it always was a dismay to me in terms of how some of my teachers treated me at Westside. So I was expecting something different here. Uh, there was one of our teachers who talked about uh, the basic inferiority of the Negro mind. We had looked up to Dr. To Dr. Salerno, all right? And uh, for him to be in charge of math as well as uh, not to have uh, had that kind of respect for, for us, that hurt an awful lot. Right. So earlier in uh, Westside, I already had experienced a lot more prejudice uh, in, in this country. And so we came to Rutgers. One of the things in coming to Rutgers, my expectation was that here we would be with a lot more uh, people in America who were highly educated from affluent areas, who hopefully had different ideas, who hopefully, hopefully was much more flexible in their understanding and their relationship to respecting other minorities and especially how they were gonna be treated uh, me and my fellow black students. We experienced quite a bit of uh, racism at uh, Rutgers itself. Uh, we experienced racism with people going by different of uh, the fraternity houses, people hollering out niggers, uh, other very hurtful things. People writing things on the wall for us. People telling us that we didn't belong there. So, this was my beginning experience at, at Rutgers. We understood quite definitely that Rutgers would need to change. When Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in April the 4th, 1968, uh, a day after my, day before, in fact, my birthday, uh, at that point, that was a shock to us. For me and for many of us, as we talked about that, we felt that we didn't have any cover anymore. Who would stand up for us? Who would fight these large institutions in terms of how we would be treated? Who would indeed come to make some type of input to say that life needs to change here? Who would change the cultural imperatives here that said that if you're you was of the white culture, that yours were the advantage culture. If you was of the black culture, yours was disadvantaged. You needed to learn alternative cultural rules. You need to fit into alternative cultural kinds of social interaction. You needed to understand that and, be, and somehow be part of that. You need to know how to be quiet and listen. This was the record. I'll say more about that later, but obviously I don't want to usurp the time from my other panel members. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. So moving on to Robin Zimmerman Murrow, Rutgers College class of 1976. Tell us a little about yourself and why you came to Rutgers. Thank you. Um, it seems like there might be a, a commonality in that we, you know, uh, oppression, discrimination, disenfranchisement. Um, while certainly my story is, is not your story, uh, the idea of being a pioneer and breaking barriers and coming to a college to make change really appealed to me in being a member of the first class of women at Rutgers. And I remember uh, when the a recruiter came to my high school and he talked to us and he said, well, you know, we're only ex accepting about 500 women. And I said, well, I want to do that. I want to do that. I could not believe that Rutgers College was still all male for one thing. So it, 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 it was astonishing to me. And I didn't want to go to Douglas. I wanted to go to Rutgers and really be um, somebody that made things different and that showed a different perspective in all of the classes. So um, I came during orientation. There were so many men running around campus, drinking, carrying on, and there were and then there were us. 
the, the women that were scattered around. And I remember when I went into the, um, Tinsley was my dorm and the elevator door opened and there were about 11 or 12 guys and there was me. And I said, okay, that's my ratio. And when I went into my first classes, I was frequently the only woman there. And it took some, I don't know, some guts to really speak. Because every time I opened my mouth, all eyes would go to me. And what's she going to say? What's she going to say? You know, what's her, what's her perspective? And um, throughout my career at Rutgers, I didn't uh, experience the horrors of uh, bias and discrimination that you ran into. They were, I was a few years later, um, and there were, there were different activists on campus, but feminism, women's rights, whatever they called it was alive and alive and well. And that sort of drew me. So I, um, became an English major. And I was in, I was telling my panelists, I was in the first class of honors English, which they gave us half a semester to finish. Now I see there's a whole big honors college. You get two years to do your work. Um, and uh, I went on to Douglas to participate in their first certificate in women's studies. And that was led by Elaine Schulwater. And what I had said earlier in the prep is that I do battle here at, at Rutgers to be heard, to be seen, to make change. Then I go to Douglas to relax, be among other women, talk about leadership, study the, the literature. It was usually Victorian literature when women were walking into the ocean and killing themselves because they couldn't live their lives. There were a lot of books like that that we read. Come back here, read Hemingway's big too hard at river for the 15th time, go back to, to Douglas and read something that was much more uh, personal and inspiring. So having both of those experiences, I thought was fantastic. When I left Rutgers, um, I went to Hopkins and got an MFA in fiction writing and left that, graduated from there and went into advertising and then found a job at NYU. They were advertising for a writer. I had no idea what fundraising was. I joined the NYU team. It was fantastic. And my career in fundraising, I've been 40 years of fundraising executive at different universities and, and healthcare institutions. My last one, which I want to, uh, to mention, is the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And they had, I had helped, I helped raise money to take on police reform after the, uh, the killing of George Floyd and to really work for a new sense of, of public safety in a, what we were saying was a racially just America of the 21st century. And um, I will say that throughout my trajectory, because also at Rutgers, I had raised money with Paul Robeson Jr. for the Paul Robeson Jr. Center, raised money with, uh, Sam Proctor for the first campaign for community diversity and educational excellence before anybody even used those words or knew about those things. And I want to give a shout out <clears throat> to two of my guests, Bruce Newman, who was the president of the Rutgers Foundation at that time, who was supportive and created this campaign, and John Pearson who, at the Rutgers Foundation, who also helped raise money for things that I see now on campus, acknowledging uh, the, the great perspectives of these great champions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have Robert Vance, Rutgers College class of 1971. Yeah. First of all, let me tell you, I'm shocked to be 75, 72 years old now, and 50 <laughs> years removed from when we first came here. Actually, 54 years removed from when we first came here. Uh, I chose Rutgers College because at the time, uh, economics were a major concern, and Rutgers offered the best education, the most diverse education, and the most various operate, uh, areas that we could major in of any school that I considered. All the schools I considered at the time, Lafayette, Lehigh, Cornell, were all men's schools, right? and I came to Rutgers as a men's school. So my education there was all with males. I started in five-year chemical engineering. There were a couple of women in, the, in my classes that were 
probably enrolled at Douglas, as I recall, but they were taking engineering classes at Rutgers. That's the only place you could have that. Uh, but I spent four years finishing up my five-year degree because I didn't get a five-year degree. I got a degree in uh, journalism. The engineering curriculum killed me. The first year I was registered for 22 and a half credit hours, I think my freshman year, including Air Force ROTC. And I had not come here thinking that life could be so hard. Uh, I had a good education from Livingston High School. Uh, I, my first midterms, I did very well on because I had good training in, in calculus and chemistry from, from uh, my high school classes. And the grades came out okay. So I was on the crew team, uh, went down to Florida, rode. Uh, and then I suddenly found out that the thing to do at Rutgers wasn't to lie around on the lawn in front of uh, one of the dorms and get a tan and to drink at night. Uh, I was partying all the time. My grades went down. And at the end of the freshman year, I realized I had to change majors. So I got out of that. I majored in for a semester in psychiatry in psychology and a major for a year in sociology. And then I finally got into journalism and my degree was in journalism. Uh, women were going to come in in 1972. Uh, in 1970, I wrote a letter to the Targum with two other roommates of mine that were both members of uh, Chi Psi fraternity. I, was, I had pledged that fraternity but never joined. And we wrote a letter to the Targum protesting we didn't want women to come to Rutgers. We were a male school and we kind of liked that. Uh, I forget what our real logic was behind it at the time. Now I'm kind of ashamed to say that I did that. Uh, I also came in to, from a totally white high school. I hadn't intermingled with blacks before. Uh, it was a new experience. Uh, we were kind of segregated on campus. The black students didn't seem to mingle with the white students that much. It was a gradual process. And over the course of four years, and continuing ever since then, I learned that I came to school not realizing I was a racist, but I was. My parents were racist, and I was a racist. And I learned from being at Rutgers and from what I've done since that time, most importantly, the work we did recently involving Paul Robeson Plaza, just how racist we all were coming into that class. Uh, there was, I'm sure there were some exceptions, some noble people in that class, but I didn't enter as one of them. I thought I was fine. And then I found out that, in fact, I wasn't. So the biggest thing I took away from, from Rutgers, really, was that realization that people are all entitled to equal treatment. They're all created equal, and they should all have the same opportunities. And I've been working towards that ever since. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to uh, transition over to a couple current students. Uh, we have Yasmin Ibrahim. She is a School of Arts and Sciences class of uh, 2022. I almost said 1922. Excuse me. <laughs> You're a senior. And again, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose Rutgers. Hi, I'm Yasmin. Um, I am part of class of 22. I'm currently majoring in health administration. Um, I am born and raised in Bronx, New York, and also in Rutgers backyard, Somerset, New Jersey. Um, I choose Rutgers University because it prom it gave me the promise of a diverse education while at the same time not having to sacrifice as the quality of education that I'm receiving as well. Um, I needed to stay near my family being a first generational um, immigrant student. Um, my parents are Ghanaian American um, immigrants. And I know that with being with Rutgers, it made sure that I was able to be on that track to pre-med. That was my original track. I came here under a sociology major with hopes of maybe getting a medical degree in my near future and such, but 
spending my time here at Rutgers, it opened my eyes up to so many various different opportunities as well as various communities as well. Um, so now I switched over to health administration because I believe that, especially in the quality of care that minorities receive, I wanna be able to make a difference behind the scene. And um, I know that as well as being able to infiltrate and get to know as many different populations here at Rutgers, I have been able to see all the different things and all the different needs that other people need as besides my own. But um, going off a lot of the things that um, the past alumni have said, it's very interesting seeing how Rutgers has come so far in that sense and also still has a long way to go. I know that even being still here at Rutgers and sitting in my classes, sometimes I'm the only face that resembles myself, but I know that Rutgers still has that promise and that continuous progress as to working to become more diverse. They still have that diversity, um, making sure that the school is diverse in that sense that we get to see different people and learn about different cultures and seeing, but knowing that Rutgers has made that promise to continuously grow and see their faults is mainly the reason why I not only chose Rutgers, but chose to stay at Rutgers and finish my degree here. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Evan Nastarowicz. Nastarovich. Nastarovich. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> He's a School of Engineering, class of 2023. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Evan. I'm currently a mechanical engineering major. Uh, I'll probably look to achieve a minor in economics um, and maybe com computer science. Um, but I was someone who was born and raised in Freehold Township. Um, and I very much had the pride of, you know, being a New Jerseyan. Uh, I didn't have a, a specific college that I att intended on attending. Um, so when I was accepted to the Honors College here at Rutgers, um, which was still, you know, relatively new, I think I was the fourth or fifth class here, um, and receiving funding that would allow my education to focus on the education and not the economics behind it, uh, I decided to come here. I also knew I wanted to go to a large school um, that would allow me to uh, delve and develop skills in various professional um, and philanthropy organizations, um, which has sort of led me to my involvement in the Scarlet Council, um, where I'm able to focus on raising funds for Scarlet Promise grants, which allow uh, many students, including myself, who need the financial aid to um, attend school, you know, focus on, on what we're doing here at school rather than um, the repercussions of our our decisions to study afterwards. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So we have um, some questions for the alums here. Uh, the first question is, how did you feel about student activism on campus? And um, how did you feel about everything that was happening? Uh, and we'll start with Dr. Green, please. Uh, it, it represents itself uh, when we got here. Oh, that's right. You can't hear me. Let me take that off. Uh, when we got here at Rutgers in 1967, uh, one of the things, again, uh, we felt the, the change needed to take place at Rutgers because we did not fit in here and uh, the college itself did not seem as though it wanted to change to allow us to fit here. Our activism came because we saw very few black students here. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that my friend Gregory Stewart and I often talked about, as well as my Jack, is that we can go a whole day at Rutgers in classes, being the only person there that's of color. Not just necessarily, uh, definitely no one else black in there. And no one who's uh, Hispanic in there. We would then be in those classes and that whole day at the end, we may not even see anyone else black for that whole day. And if we saw them, it looked like they would maybe about a mile down the road. This was not the institution 
that we felt was going to be inclusive, that was reaching out to give opportunity, educational opportunity, a chance to be able to compete on the world stage. This was not our concept of what that institution would be like. We did not see faculty members and senior administrators that looked like us, that we felt that when we was having problems with other students or even other professors uh, that we can go and talk to. This was not the kind of place that we had come to be here. After that, as I said before, April 4th, 1968 was a wake up call for me. Dr. King being shot and killed, it meant one of the major persons who we felt was making major changes throughout the United States was now dead. That his nonviolent approach somehow had led to an overwhelming amount of violence each time he presented himself and presented his ideas, only asking for equality, only asking to be recognized as a human being, only asked him to be advanced based on his merit and was being rejected. We felt at that time that we had to get much more involved at Rutgers. We had to begin to let them know that the status quo in Rutgers was not acceptable. The number of black students in Rutgers was not acceptable. The number of black faculty at Rutgers was not acceptable. The number of senior administrators and even junior administrators at Rutgers was not satisfactory. The kinds of cultural events that took place that did not include our culture was not acceptable. The kinds of mixers that we thought was open to everyone but we went there to our shock and amazement. We were not really accepted there. We would never win again. So whenever they had certain cultural events and social events, it was directed much more in terms of the white culture. We felt that that needed to change. In feeling that that needed to change, we also knew that the school was not representative of what was happening to black folk throughout the United States, what was happening in this in, in, in Newell, what was happening in Camden, what was happening throughout the South, what was happening throughout the, the West. It needs to be much more reflective of those things. We began to press on the administration that it was not sufficient to bring black students here without a clear plan as to how you were gonna be able to sustain them while they were here. It was not good enough to say, we bring the black students here and tell them, look to your left, look to your right, that person wouldn't be here. The folks on my left and right were white, they smiled. Our interpretation, at least mine, and Greg was that they knew that they didn't have to worry about us. Was that true? I don't know that. I don't know if that's what they felt, but that's the impression that we got. And, and that was not acceptable. Not having courses in Africana studies, talking about uh, Africa, talking about our cultural experience, talking about our history was not acceptable. Those had to change not setting up ways to be able to have a rigorous way of providing tutorial services, to be able to have mentors, to make sure that when people are getting in trouble psychologically, socially, academically, that they just weren't flunking out. After those first set of hourlies that came, and I don't know whether you still have hourlies or not, uh, 
there was quite a number of brothers that was quickly in trouble. They got a, a warning that they, they were on the basis of the, that they were becoming in academic trouble. After that first semester, as small as our number was, it shrank even further. This was not acceptable. You need to have a program that only bring black students to Rutgers College, but be able to maintain them there, be able to help them thrive so that they can go out and get professional job, go to graduate school, get professional degree, and be a major contributor in terms of the society. Not put them through the mill and turn them out. Uh, Jeff Sammons has been trying to get the whole list of black students that were here. So many of them flunked out that, you know, we had to even say, well, what happened to them? That's not what we want here. If you bring in such a small number, it is no way that that's going to end up being sustained. So we need, we, we gave them demands that we needed that to change. We need to bring in more black students, we need to change the way that they went about academics. It wasn't enough to say that if you was having 650 on, on the verbal, 650 on, your, on the math part, then you were the kind of candidate that Rutgers wanted, but we really preferred that you had 800 on each one, a score of 1,600, and you can definitely come here. That was not going to be acceptable for us. That they needed to change how they were going to do it. So we put the, that pressure on Rutgers. So we became part of the activism. We did the marching. We sat down and talked to, to faculty and staff. We talked to other students. We, we marched up and down College Avenue. We got heckled. We got racist comments thrown at us, but we still did it. One of the things that some of the black students did, they decided to do that at a major Rutgers football game. Uh, I know that Debbie is here. She remembered that was with Rutgers and uh, an army. I wasn't sure whether it was Rutgers and army or, or Rutgers and Princeton, but my guess was. Okay, so my memory is still there. Thank you, Brother Maja. <laughs> that. They then march at the intermission at that point to raise the consciousness of Rutgers students, student body, administrators, faculty, staff, that the current status quo was not acceptable. Focusing in on your investment of a country like South Africa as means of providing income here and at the same time saying that you're going to be able to try to help black folks was not acceptable. Not addressing the issue of black students as they are flunking out of here was not acceptable. Not providing the type of cultural uh, enriched program that we can feel acceptable was, was not acceptable. So these are the things that then fuel our activism. Not only was this taking place during the major civil, civil rights events, but our time here was taking place during the Vietnam War. Going to fight in Vietnam to other brown people who had never come to enslave us or control us was not acceptable. Let me stop there and give the rest of my panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Uh, Robin, how about you? Um, same question. Uh, how did you feel about student activists on campus? How was it different in your time period as well? So I do think that between 72 and 76, it was a completely different uh, tenor. Uh, there was so much going on in the 60s when you were there in the, the late 60s between the civil rights and, and Vietnam. By the time, you know, we came to college, it had sort of 
tailed off, the, the war was ending. It, it doesn't mean the issues were gone, they, they were there. And unfortunately, some of the issues that we were active about are still here today. They haven't changed all that much, women's rights, abortion rights, uh, and so on. But I think for us, and I can only speak from uh, representing the class of women, our activism was actually being there at Rutgers. And um, it made me remember when Rob said, oh, we didn't want women there. They didn't. Um, Douglas didn't want us there either. And so we were sort of in this um, world of our own where uh, the men didn't want us, the, the Douglas women, you know, said things about Rutgers women, and, uh, and we just soldiered on. And one of the great things about Rutgers and my experience there was the faculty. The faculty were incredible. And as Rob said, the economics of going to Rutgers uh, created access to so many first-gen students, to so many students from New Jersey who might not have been able to afford to go to a Rutgers of that quality. I, I can't even, it was like a couple hundred dollars compared to what, 75, 80,000 to go to an NYU today. It was incredible. And the faculty were just so broadly recognized, very empathetic, um, really, and maybe, you know, I was privileged because I was in the upper classes, I was in the honors classes, I was able to work with some of the best faculty at the college, but even so, when I branched out, I was just very, very impressed with the way that they, with they worked with students. And some of them were more active and more vocal than others about, especially women's rights, since I was in the women's um, certificate program at Douglas and, <clears throat> and needed to find mentors and needed to find allies um, at Rutgers College as well. And was able to find them, but I think the fact that the population triple, right? That's what you said of women in the next year. Um, not everything was in place by any means. We didn't have the mentors. We didn't have people looking out for us. It was a, an experience that I, to this day say, prepared me for New York City and having to fight my way to the front of the line and to get what I wanted because Rutgers, it was large and I loved that. That's why I chose it. But it really taught you how to, to be your own advocate and to advocate for others if that was your plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rob, um, how about you? How did you feel about activism at the time and everything that was happening on campus? Well, as I said before, I, I came from a totally white high school. I had a totally white background, and uh, my expo first exposure, good exposure to black people was when I came to Rutgers. I was in Hageman Hall in the quad, and my uh, dorm, whatever they call them, preceptor, was Jerry Harris. And Jerry and I got along pretty well. We liked each other, uh, and I felt like I was getting to know him, the first black person in my life. Demonstrations were going on, began to go on. Uh, there were people marching down George Street. Uh, and we watched them from our dorms, and we were kind of like spectators. We weren't really participating. It was going on around us. Uh, we weren't prepared to change. We were part of the reason they had to do that marching was because we were so resistant to change. Um, and I'm ashamed to say that now, but as I said before, one of the big things about life at Rutgers as it went on and life after Rutgers and the stuff I've done since then, I've learned so much more about the appropriate role of the various races in this country and how they all need to work together. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for our current students, uh, well, we just heard about what the late 60s and early 70s was like. Uh, um, how is it for you, comparatively? Yasmin? 
Um, it's very interesting um, hearing about um, the alumni's experience and how that translates into what we see today, for sure. I know that, especially during the George Floyd um, protests at that time, a lot of us were still at home battling the pandemic while still having to arrange a whole march on campus and pulling people from different parts of New Jersey as well as out-of-state students to rally together to speak more about police brutality and how that has to deal how that has to deal with how we experience life on campus. I know that often um, it's the racism and the social activism that we see on campus is not necessarily blatant. It's sometimes the things that we have to battle within the institution, making sure that things as we see as far as like, as um, Dr. Um, Leon Green, right? Um, has mentioned that when it comes to facing with the Africana departments and making sure that our classes are not seen as electives, but are also given the core requirements and make sure that we're able to use those same classes to graduate Rutgers and such and have that institution be able to recognize ba Black fa faculty and not only just have Black faculty here on campus, but make sure that they're tenured as well and on that tenured track. It's very subtle things that we have to deal with and subtle things that we have to face with, especially um, a big part of what he also said is making sure that we're not only getting black students and minority students here on campus, but making sure that they have a track to stay on campus. I know that from my freshman year and all the friends that I have made, a lot of them are not here. A lot of my roommates that I've seen and started out on this journey during Rutgers University are not here with me and will not be walking across the stage with me to graduate because we have to at least work twice as harder, especially to make sure that we're not only being on track, but we're not necessarily allowed to have all the same fun that we can as our counterparts because we have a million different things that we're also battling at home, at our hometowns, and being able to be here here and being present within our classes. I know that as long, especially with social activism, it's a big part of also intersectionality of being not only just black, but being a black man, being a black woman, being black and part of the LGBTQ plus A community and having to face that and having to make sure that you're not only present in every sense of being on campus, but being present in yourself, especially during these like this age group, a lot of the time, we're just trying to find ourselves and find what we really want to do, especially starting out with one certain track and come changing your major like the first time, third time, three times and all that, and having to really navigate that, but also being our first time being on our own especially trying to figure out how to be able to operate within groups. I know that a big part of Rutgers is pushing diversity and making sure that the campus is diverse, but a lot of the times that it's not necessarily segregated when we get on campus, most people just move to more particular groups that they know and are more familiar with. And it makes it much more difficult for them to interact with students that they must not know or they've never been experienced. So, I mean, it pushes us to be able to interact with students that we're not necessarily going to interact with our future or with our backgrounds. I know that being with the Bronx, being from the Bronx and being raised in the Bronx, I know that I naturally gravitated more towards black students and as, as well as the Hispanic, specifically the Dominican population here at Rutgers. But I know that especially with my white counterparts, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be about where we're from, but the things that we're interested in and having to bridge that gap and having to come together and realize like we're not that much more different. We just have different starting points or different backgrounds that we're coming from. But I know that when it comes to social activism, when those times of when the media especially is putting pressure for us to speak up on things and protest things and address things that are happening right before our eyes, it's usually like, are you my friend when it's time to party? Or are you my ally when it's time to talk about difficult issues such as racism, such as feminism, such as the oppression that LGBTQA students um, 
come to, even though they're not necessarily your problems, but these are problems that you do have issues with. And it's also time we work better as a team than individual and such. So I know that when it comes to social activism here on campus, I know it's a lot much difficult than just being more than just performative and actually putting in the actions and actually showing up to be a part of the protests and making sure that this isn't just a one-time thing. We have to carry it out through policies and carry out through our actions and making sure that we're not only holding ourselves accountable, but as well as holding the larger institution of Rutgers University and the things that are put in place to make sure that we're all here together and not just here in our own separate groups. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Evan, how about you? Yeah, for me, um, I think the university and the different groups that are present um, do work to really support um, and nurture these uh, physical protests and these physical you know, movements. But a lot of what I've experienced in my three years of being here has been this new age of almost information activism, just being able to um, be exposed to the different ideas through various medias um, and, and group opportunities and understanding the problems um, on a more individual level has allowed myself and I, I think a lot of you know, students here today to be better suited and, and to be more um, involved in the, in the issues that are present um, and, and trying to solve this. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure information back um, when you guys were all in school, you know, in the 70s um, and the 60s, I'm sure information was there. But I think between the, the technological advancements that have happened, really being able to immediately find information um, about this, about these causes and, and find, you know, ways to be involved has allowed many more um, students to immediately become um, invested in these, um, you know, sort of activist movements. Thank you. So all of you, uh, we'd like to ask, well, what did you love about your experience at Rutgers or what do you love? Uh, starting with Dr. Green. Uh, as I said or to you earlier, uh, this is probably the most difficult question for me to contemplate in, in terms of what did I love about Rutgers. But there are some things. Foremost is that Rutgers gave me an opportunity to meet some friends with which I developed a friendship while I was at Rutgers that has literally lasted throughout my lifetime. They're all sitting right there up front. And there are others that are not there. But that's important, who you can have an intellectual experience with and talk about issues and get support. And when things are going bad, you can call them up and get support. When you think that there's a, a social issue that needs to be addressed, that you can talk to them about and people can start figure out, well, how can we get money to do this? How can we help the black students here at Rutgers? How can we do these other things? Having that kind of group is something that got fostered here for me uh, at, at Rutgers. Rutgers also did something that uh, perhaps similar for you is that it taught me that these issues, this social activism, this addressing racism, discrimination, poverty, inequity, that these issues would not be going away, that you would have to fight them on multiple levels continually, and that learning at Rutgers to become a social activist, become the president of the, the Student Afro-American Society, to help lead that organization until we finally had a point in 1969 where we uh, had to have records closed down so we can demand that not only the faculty and administrators, but the students listen to us in terms of what our problems and concerns were 
and that the Board of Governors begin to address those issues in a systematic way, that those things would continue, that I would have to learn how to balance on the one hand, how to do well on my studies, and on the other hand, how to continue the social activism. And that learning that early in life is something that bode well for me going on into my profession, that that would be something that I now know that I would have to constantly do. And that's a skill that I learned at Rutgers, that while others had the luxury of really coming here and focusing in on their study, making sure they were getting an excellent grade, I had either the misfortune or the circumstance in which I had to focus not only on trying to do well in, in school and graduate with distinction and go on to graduate school and, and go on to other uh, prestigious universities in terms of getting my degrees and coming back to Rutgers, getting uh, a master's of, uh, of science as well as getting a, a PhD. All of that, I've learned from Rutgers that that would be something that would be a strength that I would have to, to learn to do. One other thing, Rutgers does have excellent staff and faculty in terms of, of their training, their degrees, their prominence. Uh, and so in terms of being able to be taught by some of the best in the world, that's a, a, an important resource to have. Because I'm angry at things does not mean I can't recognize what you can provide for me that will be helpful for me later in life. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank you. Uh, I loved Rutgers um, in spite of whatever um, it, and many flaws and pimples it had. Um, but Rutgers taught me how to think. And it wasn't just the faculty and what I read, it was the students. It was the, where there were 7,000 on this campus, 41,000 throughout the whole university. And I loved that. I loved having choice. And I loved having all, all the difference, not difference the way that we think about it today. But certainly these were people from, uh, most of them were New Jersey, but they weren't people that I, um, well, let me let me go back there. I loved having uh, the choice and the and the large population of Rutgers. And when I say taught me how to think at that time, for women, hard to believe. But you know, they we're still wrestling with, gee, should I get a job or should I get married? Um, do I need a job? How do I go into business? Can a woman, quote, have it all? All of those kinds of, you know, cliched ways of thinking, can we have it all, um, actually never occurred to me when I was here because I had so many role models around me, the, the women that were in my class, I had the faculty, and they really emphasized by their actions and by the, just being there, the importance of leadership and women's leadership. And I remember, I think it was at the end, I kind of get confused as to when I was here as a student and when I was here as a staff member working for the foundation, but Charlotte Bunch started the Women's Global Leadership Center. And I remember listening to her and it was a completely different kind of concept of leadership that wasn't hierarchical with uh, the guys at the top, you know, and, and going down the ladder and the women or the whites at the top and going down the ladder or the, you know, straight people at the top and going, going down the ladder. She had this whole other idea of leadership that was so much more equitable, so much more inclusive and so much uh, more fair. And I thought, that's right. There are possibilities. There are opportunities. And Rutgers showed that to me again and again. I'm not somebody to come back to homecoming, believe me. But I feel so strongly about what this university makes possible for people, even when it trips over itself. And it doesn't give you everything you need. You know, we talked about the, the classic, the are you screw? Oh, yeah. It happened again and again and again. And ask me how often I was guaranteed housing. One semester. 
And then it was, you know, go out and find your place to live, just like in real life after college. Nobody was coddled here at Rutgers. And it Rutgers made mistakes, but at the, at the center of this university was this belief in extraordinary scholarship, extraordinary research, the centers that were built uh, on the, about uh, the neurosciences, about, um, I, I don't even know them all, but there were 12 centers, I think, that we raised money for when I was here as an employee, an employee that are still the leading in the world, in the world, the environmental centers. Rutgers is, has come so far, and the best thing about it is that it hasn't become entrenched in bad history, in its mistakes. It keeps trying to evolve and get better. And I think hearing from these students and why, why they're here and what they're trying to achieve and how it's different from them is just so uh, heartening uh, to me. And I just hope that Rutgers keeps moving forward. Rob? Well, when I was here at Rutgers, it was ages 17 through 21. Those are years in which you really find yourself and figure out a lot of things. So I wouldn't say Rutgers taught me to think. I learned to think at Rutgers. Uh, a lot of that was because of the people I was exposed to. Uh, faculty was excellent, but the friends I made at Rutgers were what really made my life and, and uh, helped me to become the man I eventually became. It's been a long struggle for me. Uh, I've been through a lot of things in my life, but... Uh, Rutgers was at the start of when I really realized what life was supposed to be about. The thing I loved most about Rutgers initially was being on the crew team. Uh, we would get up at six in the morning and run down to the boathouse. Uh, we'd run over to Douglas and climb down the cliffs and cross Route 18. And there was a class of 1919 19 boathouse, I think it was, uh, where we would go out and row in the morning. And then sometimes we'd have double sessions and row later in the afternoon. We'd be out there on the river, sometimes there'd be ice on the water. Uh, it was so cold. Uh, I remember the, the agony of having my hands covered with blisters and bloodied. And I asked the coaches, you know, what can I do about this? And I said, well, can I wear gloves? No, you got to get tough. So I tried to do that. It wasn't that successful, but um, and the river smelled like vinegar. Uh, it was nothing you'd want to go into. Cyanamid was polluting the river at the time pretty badly. It's changed since then, but it was... Uh, Pretty horrible then. But nonetheless, that experience of being with eight other men in that boat and out on the river was the highlight of, of several years at Rutgers for me. Um, I finally got a chance to row competitive, competitive, competitively my junior year and uh, because I had academic issues the first two years here at Rutgers. And they mentioned the things about support at Rutgers. Support at Rutgers was not the ideal thing. You had to take advantage of what it had to offer. They weren't going to give it to you. Uh, and if, by my junior year, I finally figured that out. So I got to go out on the, on the, on the river and on, on the lakes and, and row with the team uh, because I finally got my academics up to the level where it should have been the entire time. So I, I would say that is my fondest memory of Rutgers is being part of the crew team. Thank you. <laughs> yes, me? Um, <clears throat> um, I know that, um, as far as Rutgers, um, I know that Rutgers, my favorite part would probably be the position that Rutgers has put me in and how it shaped me as a person. Um, coming into Rutgers as high school, I was like straight A's, 4.2 GPA, president of this, that, and the third and everything. And I was ready. I thought I was ready to conquer Rutgers, but Rutgers conquered me my first year. I was, and as it's funny to hear that, like, are you screw is still like a huge thing. If anything, it turned into, are you crying? And I know that with Rutgers, it's, it shaped me into the woman that I am today. Um, being able to fail a test one some, one class and having to rush over, catch an LX and run to my next class and being able to be like, I'll get the next test. The next test will, it will be my A, it will be my strength. And I know that it's been a really difficult time as well, maneuvering Rutgers and being able to 
become stronger from that because one thing about records is it won't coddle you, not one bit, not one at all. You have to be able to hold yourself accountable and being able to take opportunities and push yourself to be who you know you can be. I know that with Rutgers, I had to get uncomfortable to shape myself to who I am today. And through that being uncomfortable, I've learned to be a part, I'm a RUSA representative, which is working within the student assembly and working in the government, as well as being a DRC woman and being able to advocate for young women here as well to take opportunities and make it into them, be, apply to internships within your freshman year. Even if you don't think you have the um, the experience, build that experience as soon as you can. Being able to be a president of my org, Sisters with Values, making sure that no matter what, where you're from and your background, you're able to come together as well, as well as working within the United Black Council and being able to work with making sure that the diaspora of here Oh, sorry, <clears throat> working at the diaspora of Black students here at Rutgers are having that stability, having that conversation brought up to administration to build that, that gap, build that bridge to them. I know that Rutgers has really pushed me to be the leadership that I am today as far as even running my own campaign. I've been working within the Rutgers Foundation since like my freshman year, calling alumni, letting them know about things that have been going on, only to be able to offer a position my senior year to be able to do that and affect and create that, that philanthropy within that senior year, making sure that students are able to give back and be able to show Rutgers that like, these are the funds that really helped me and shaped me as the person today. I know that even being a recipient of the Scarlet Promise Grant, when my father lost my job and having to balance that in school, as well as also George Floyd and the whole thing, I know that Rutgers was at least giving me that that stability, that support to be able to still keep pushing on, to still be able to present events to students, to remember that even though you're a student and even though you're going through whatever the world has put, been putting you through, that you remain resilient and stay resilient. I feel that that R for Rutgers really stands for resilient because Throughout the pandemic, I was here pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and now still here post-pandemic. It's been such a world of a roller coaster that we have to, as students, be able to go through that and stay here and making sure that we're getting the grades. It's not only about just surviving at Rutgers, but it's really about thriving at Rutgers and being able to get those accolades and being that student that stands out. And I know that Rutgers has been able to make sure that if one path is, you think you have one path here at Rutgers, but there's so many other paths that you can take to become the person that you are. And I mean, I'm no far, like I'm no more done. I'm not done growing as a person, but as far as Rutgers has really toughened me up to be able to go into the workforce and go into the real world to be able to be like, okay, what's up? I'm here. <laughs> so thank you. Great, thank you. Evan? Yeah, for me, uh, my favorite part of Rutgers has been the various means with which uh, I've been able to create relationships and, and friendships. Um, I know at the end of the day, if I, if I have a bad day, um, I get to go home to my house of, of 10 housemates and I get to have a good time with them no matter what and, and know that you know, no matter the circumstances, I will have people I can be with and, and enjoy and see myself um, maintaining relationships for, for many years to come. I think Rutgers also did a great job of allowing me time to really reflect on um, the activities and the, the various aspects of my life that I, I truly do value the most. Um, while I'll be endlessly you know, appreciative of the, the education that I'm currently getting, um, I know 10 years down the road, even five years down the road, the, the things that will really be sticking with me are the, the opportunities I was given to have fun and, and enjoy and experience um, Rutgers and, and my college years with the, uh, the people I've been able to connect with. Thank you, Evan. We're almost at the, towards the end and I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A. So I think why don't we um, start with Q&A, is that okay everybody?
Is this, oh. <laughs> Eric, I want to thank you for moderating the panel this um, afternoon. You being an alumnus from the 90s, you're kind of dead smack in between our alumni and our current students. Can you speak a little bit about your experiences compared to everyone and what they just talked about as well? Thank you. Yeah, I, it's been wonderful hearing everybody's experiences and how similar ours all are in so many ways, uh, particularly Rutgers forged us, you know, everybody that I met here at Rutgers are good, good friends still today. And particularly what Robin had said, there's so much choice. I liked that it was big. I liked that there were so many different things I could do. Um, I went in as a history, I knew I wanted to be a history major. Um, and so I didn't have that issue um, as far as uh, deciding what I wanted to do. I also worked, so I worked while I was, um, going to, to college, and so I was doing a lot of school and work. Uh, however, I will point out, you know, there were so many cultural events happening here. Um, I wasn't incredibly active in a, a particular activist movement. I knew there was always something that would, would interest me, that would get me involved. I knew one of, the, one of the big things that we did get involved with was Are You for the Homeless? That was something that was happening in the 80s and the, and the early 90s, as well as Take Back the Night. So I participated in a lot of those, and I already felt that there was this tradition of activism. And I loved that. I loved that I could study, I could listen to somebody speak. Mary Baraka spoke um, on campus, among many others, and that I had beyond the classroom so many different educational opportunities. Also going into New York City, um, I know that was a, the major thing for me. So again, turning me into adult, forging me into somebody who understood the world, who could also roll with the punches because of, you know, it's Rutgers. You have to be resilient. You have to be kind of strong. But just the kind of diversity of, of experiences that I got at Rutgers really shaped me as a person. And excellent. I mean, it was great value for money. I mean, we didn't have a lot. I couldn't really afford to go to many other schools. I had an excellent education at Rutgers, and I think I probably remember every single class that I took, almost every. There were just excellent professors, excellent students. Um, and also, I saw a lot of concerts here, too. I don't know if that was the same. So this was just a, a total experience for me that really made me into an adult who could survive in the world, basically. Um, but I'd love to hear some other questions here. Uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you, sir. Hmm? I don't. I don't need a microphone. Oh, okay. Uh, we have, oh, okay. Wanted to say first of all how much I enjoyed the panel, how much I learned uh, today from everyone on it. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Sammons, uh, class of 71, Rutgers College, uh, professor of history at New York University. And I give a lion's share of the credit for my success, whatever that is, uh, to uh, my Rutgers experience. But I want to put a number on our experience, Leon, okay. uh, and Erica in particular, because I want to work with you on establishing the exact numbers of those who entered who were black in the class of 67. I mean, a, a class of 71, but the entering class of 67, and also to try to put names to them. But we believe that the number, and you said that there were something like 1,700 plus students in the class of 71, entering in 67, um, from Robin, is it, yep. that 300 women came to Rutgers in? 587. 572? 87. 87. Okay. We believe that there are not many more than 40 blacks who entered in 1967. And that was the largest number of blacks to come to Rutgers to date. So uh, get some sense of isolation, uh, being overwhelmed, and it was mostly, so it was, it was all male, but mostly white males at, at, at Rutgers. And 
I must admit, was the best of times and the worst of times. And racism was a large part of the worst of times at Rutgers for me. Any other questions, ma'am? I don't have a question, but it is oh. a statement. Um, I'm the first graduating class from the Houston College. And I want to thank all of you. Who paved the way for me to be able to go to Livingston? Um, I wasn't exactly an HBC type student. I came from Newark, New Jersey. Never knew how I was going to go to college, but I knew I was going. Um, knew Grace Stewart for a lot of my um, childhood years growing up in Newark. And each one of you, or many of you, in many ways, sometimes I would see you when I come over to Rutgers um, College at the library. I emulated um, you. I didn't have a lot of um, role models other than the black women that were at Livingston College. You did a fantastic job um, in helping, I'm sure, to select some of those uh, black females that were at Livingston College. You know, it's just so much history that between 1969 when I went in and 73 when I graduated and then when you, you, you came in. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Um, because I knew I was going to college, didn't know how, and um, you all afforded the opportunity for me to go and to get a good education. So, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes, S sir, over here. Oh. That gentleman over there. The gentleman back over um, there. You mentioned in your speech, I think it's, is it Giselle? Yeah. Uh, some yes, terms, I, I didn't know what they meant. An LX and a DRC. Can you tell, explain that? DRC is um, the Douglas Residential College um, here at campus. It's not more, some students are um, commuters, but like are, are part of the Douglas School. And then there's also a community of women that live here on campus, on campus whether it's Katzenbach, or Jamison Hall, Lippincott, or even um, Bunting Cobb and Woodbury. Um, it's kind of like a community of women where we take all similar classes and learn about the experience of past Douglas women, um, regardless of what major we are, whether we're like STEM, um, politics, like health administration. Um, it's a big community of women here at Rutgers and they're fostering to not only accept them, but also maintain them here as well. My name is Greg Stewart, and I'm a longtime friend of Dr. Leon Green. Um, but I, I just wanted to share an incident. I think in 1970, I'm a student at Rutgers College. You graduated in 1971. In 1970, in my junior year, Rutgers held a or sent out a questionnaire to all of the men asking them if they would, if they wanted women to attend Rutgers College or not, you had a vote. And to my surprise in 1970, Rutgers voted not to admit women uh, by a majority and that totally shocked me. Um, but I think the, and, and I just want to follow up on what Robin said today, that the greatest achievement of Rutgers University was the end of sex segregation in 1976. The admission of women to Rutgers University, 1976. The admission of women into the university created such an explosion of creativity, a quest for justice and equality, experimentation. It totally changed the environment of the university and made Rutgers into a community where people could talk to each other. And that was critical to making this a first-rate institution. And so I wanna just say to 
all of the women who are now members of this educational community that you guys have brought a totally new and creative um, legion to the university and made Rutgers an institution that we can all be proud of. I, I think we do. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I think we're at the tail. Do we have time for more questions? Yeah, anybody? Yes, sir. I'm going to put a little downer on it. Um, I'm a member of the class of 71. And 76, you brought in 585 women. How many Afrikaans persons were at Rutgers College at that time? Well, I'll tell you something. One of the most difficult things to find in the archives mm -hmm. are statistics about African-American enrollment prior to 1975, 1976. So when the, the 587 women were admitted uh, in 1972, I have not found any statistics that break down uh, ethnicity or race. And that's one of the drawbacks of working in the archives. They just didn't keep statistics of this nature. And there are strategies that you can work to try to suss out the, the, those numbers, but, but I don't have them because I haven't seen them. I was reviewing, we have all these enrollment statistics. I was poring over them and it's not in there. And I think that's also reflective of the times where I don't think the university was, I don't know, they weren't thinking in those terms as far as they just, I, I feel like the university probably assumed that most of their students were going to be white and didn't take those kinds of statistics. Now they might have, and I think once you get EOF, I think there's some statistics through EOF that, that I can look at, but I can certainly look into this. And, and definitely this is something that we should work on as far as uh, getting more statistics of this nature. I, I think that um, it, maybe there's a way that we can do it ourselves mm. from the class. There's less than 600 of us, but there were black, Latinx, LGBTQT. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, as we reach out and I'm happy to reach out, I wish there were more women here today from my class. Um, we knew each other. We were from, you know, Cook, Livingston, Douglas. Um, those were our residences, but, um, it's, I was thinking the same thing as, as both of you, when Dr. Green was speaking, what were the numbers? Mm -hmm. What was the percentage? And if it was 40 Oh man, that is tough. That is mm -hmm. really, really tough. Uh, because there were 7,000 at Rutgers College, 578 women, and we felt alone. So I just, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. You know, um, uh, it's yeah. humble considering. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the nation. It is. It really is. It okay. really is shocking. It is. It was incredible. If I, if I may, I'm Michael Chavies, another member of the class of '71. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> one thing that I want to mention that hasn't been mentioned uh, today is athletics. Um, I played football and baseball here for two years, and uh, one of the reasons that. I didn't go on beyond two years was because there was discrimination in athletics as well. I'm not saying that I was discriminated against. I'll leave that up to others. I came here wanting to play quarterback on the football team. First day I, at practice, coach asked me, uh, have you thought about playing halfback? Um, I was a, uh, I was one of the starting pitchers on the baseball team, but if after two years, um, I said, that's enough. And I think everybody has to realize, <clears throat> whoever you were, um, when you came here, you came here with dreams and aspirations. And some of those dreams and aspirations were not afforded to some of us, women, black men, black women, whoever you were. Um, and there are some athletes here who weren't able to achieve their dreams because of they weren't treated equally. Brian Mitchell. Some of you may not have ever heard of Brian Mitchell. He was, in my estimation, one of the greatest football players 
whoever played at Rutgers University, he was two years ahead of me. Uh, we had a great event and thanks, we can't go without recognizing Jim, Jim Savage for what you've done for Paul Robeson in the plaza. And we had a great mm -hmm. dinner last night honoring Paul Robeson and, and there's still a lot more that needs to be done in honor of Paul Robeson. So let's keep that in our minds as well. Um, but I guess to sum it up, um, let's not forget about, you know, all those athletes who, who couldn't achieve their dreams, some of whom did achieve their dreams, but still have not been recognized. Um, we know now being in the Big Ten that we have black athletes, women athletes all over the place who are being recognized. But let's look beyond that. How about our coaches? You know, how many of the coaches and um, people in athletic departments look like us? And how many women are present in those departments and on coaching staff? So I wanted to throw that out there, too. I didn't want our athletes to be forgotten. Thank you very much. I did want to say just one other thing. I think uh, I think your mic for breaking that up. One of the most disheartening things for us while we at Rutgers was that Rutgers disowned Paul Robinson. Let's be clear about it. You couldn't say his name without getting looked at strangely. They didn't want to hear it. We couldn't put up asking for a room to be for Paul Robinson. We could not ask for a center to be named. We tried to get this whole center name for Paul Robinson. Uh, you couldn't get a college name for, name for Paul Robinson. Paul Robeson is the greatest graduate of Rutgers College. You name it, he did it. He, he was a class valedictorian. He was uh, twice uh, All-American. He was a lawyer. He was an orator. He was an un unchallenged, never tiring supporter of the, un the downtrodden. He would go around the world preaching and professing for equality. He even did it for the Irishman. He did it for a lot of different places. He was, he was not even want, they didn't even want him back in this country at time. This is Rutgers greatest graduate. I'm going to say that. And I want people who think they have a greater graduate from Rutgers, put the name up. I can listen to facts. But let's be fair. This is what we work hard. If we can work, if he can work that hard, be that outstanding and still be rejected, what does all these other black boys and girls who come here before they become men, what's their possibility? What's their opportunity? That's the concern. And that was what was frightening to us, that we couldn't imagine, and Rutgers has not produced anyone greater, that if you can't be accepted if you're Paul Robeson, when can you be? And it can't be just because they say it was the common, that he was with Russia. We've had a president who's been very much in bed and very much supportive of Putin and Russia. So that can't be the reason. No, these are, not, these are just facts. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not telling you something that say, let's put this out on the paper. You know, Dr. Green said that. I'm just saying that he's been very fair that Putin likes him a lot, so he likes Putin a lot. He, so if that's the reason that if he can become president, and, and be in bed with Russia in that way, then clearly Rutgers can come to grips with Paul Robeson being his greatest graduate. After that, I'll shut up for a while. Here, here. I agree. Well, thank you so much to everybody on our panel. I learned a lot. I hope you did. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your comments uh, and, your, and your observations and your questions. And uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up now. Thank you so much again for the whole panel. It was a great honor.
Thank you all very much for your time and for sharing your stories. Um, there were a lot of people watching online who were really appreciative of everything that people were saying and cheering all of you on. Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, just want to remind everyone that we will be back here tomorrow, kicking off at 9 a.m. with the Rutgers Living History Annual Meeting, followed by a lecture from Thomas Gross, Mason Gross's son, at noon. Uh, following that, a virtual presentation on the Scarlet and, Black Pro Scarlet and Black Project will begin outside, and we will close the day with an update on the university's equity audit and strategic plan. The RUAA open house will begin shortly at 4 p.m. on Old Queen's Lawn, where you will have the opportunity to hear from Chancellor Provost Fran Conway, as well as tour the Alumni House at Van Nest Hall. The event will include the ringing of the Old Queen's bell at 5 p.m., and a shuttle will be by shortly to take you all up there. Thank you, and have a good evening. Jeff, you have a question? Go ahead. I'm sorry? Right outside the front of the building. Oh, no, right, I'm sorry. The virtual presentation tomorrow will be right out here in the lounge where the chairs are set up on the screen. I thought you meant for the shuttle. <laughs>